Hey out there. This is Saturday, December 13th, 2014, about uh, 9 o'clock in the morning here in Northern California. We've been inundated with a lot of rain lately, but today is quite lovely. You know, today I wanted to talk about some of the uh, inherent divisiveness that's been built into our societal cake. And, uh, you know, some of the divisiveness is, is obvious, and some of it is a bit more uh, elusive and hidden. Um, some of the more obvious divisiveness would be well, let's see, this guy's a conservative and this guy's a liberal, this guy's a Democrat, this guy's a Republican, this person is a man, this person is a woman, this person is a Jew, this person is a Christian, uh, this person is rich, this person is poor, this person is a communist, this person is a capitalist. And, you know, we, 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 I say we, humanity as a whole, as a collective, as one family, as one race, the human race, have to fundamentally understand just how seriously we've all been indoctrinated into this divisive paradigm. Uh, and and understand that it really makes for a miserable journey as a human being. Much more miserable than it needs to be. I mean, it's hard to be human, straight up. Uh, if tomorrow we had social economic justice in the world and an end to dubious war, an, an end to virtually all the crime, an end to poverty, an end to debt, we still have difficult things to contend with as humans. We've got to survive. We need to concern ourselves with keeping a roof over our heads. We need to concern ourselves with having food on, in our bellies and water to drink. And it's, it's very challenging just to be human. We have to face injury and death and natural disasters, not just of ourselves, but of our loved ones. So it's, it's a very difficult existence just to be mortal. And it's, it's very complex to be a human mortal because all the creatures are mortal. They're all born, they live and they die. And we as cosmic creatures, human beings, made in the image and likeness of God, face the same thing. And the only difference is we're by far and away more intelligent than all the other creatures on earth and uh, we have to understand that even though we are at the top of the intellectual food chain we still in many ways are inferior to the other creatures because we're born accepting this notion that of course you should be beholden to somebody else it's natural that you're not born free like every other creature. It just, somehow this is part and parcel of being, you know, at the top of the intellectual food chain, that we accept our bondage, we accept, uh, we accept our servitude, our enslavement into a prison planet where you have this thing called the cost of living that no other creature has to contend with. Uh, we have this commodity this uh, substance, this facet that we call money. And, you know, no other creature has to put up with this thing except us humans. And uh, this is what I mean about being born beholden and accepting this. 
So if we want to talk about division and how we're divided, we've got to we've got to look at this thing like a mathematical equation, like calculus or something. We have to say now some people will tell you you have an opinion, but you in your heart know that you have a fact and the facts are irrefutable. That's how mathematics is. That's how science is. There's only one right answer. There's no room for debate. The truth is irrefutable. These are the facts. This is the solution to the problem. And you know the, the establishmentarians, they revel in, in keeping this gray area intact. This idea that well, everything's debatable. It could be this way, it could be that way, and it's just not true. You take, for example, the, the growing wealth disparity that I've witnessed my entire life, 56 years old now, and I've been witnessing this as far back as I can remember. I've been seeing the, the gap between haves and have-nots growing, and I've been seeing the, the cutoff point growing whereby if you didn't make it into this aisle of the haves then you were stuck in this aisle with the have-nots and that it became more and more etched in stone that it became more and more difficult to jump out of the have-not aisle into the have aisle the bar just kept getting raised so when you think you got a handle on things next thing you know the bar is raised and you got to wonder why that's happening is it happening because of incompetency and <coughs> stupidity or is it deliberate and it's my firm contention that it is deliberate that what's going on here is a very wicked diabolical plan to get humanity divided into a permanent uh, set of classes a permanent underclass, if you will, where people accept their lot and they accept an ever-growing burden. They accept this idea that this is just the way it has to be. We have to continually make things more and more difficult for you in order for us to just continue to be the haves and to continue to have more and more and more. We've got to keep you poor. And they go against all reason and logic when it comes to finding solutions to our social economic problems because it's very evident that they don't want solutions they want the problems to persist Do you understand without the problems without the division these people would lose their relevance it's that simple they need chaos they need problems to stand up and say hey I got an idea let's try this knowing full well it's gonna fail it's like the Democrats and Republicans. You know, it, what we really need is, you know, we got X and Y, let's say, but we really need Z. And Z is just not, you know, it's just not being offered to us. We need a politician in, in high places, that, you know, especially at the executive level, but the, the Congress and the Senate and all this. We need people that understand the mathematical solution they understand that in order to have a, you know a semblance of justice in any society you've got to have it, it involves economics it involves fundamentally sharing the wealth and if you if you learn their true definition about politics you'll understand that money is integral into understanding politics. It's all about how the wealth of the nations are spent, you understand, and who's going to control that wealth, and who's going to determine things like economic policy, okay? And, uh, you know, if the people doing these things that are deciding those economic policies for the masses are corrupt, if they're wicked, if they don't have the best intentions in mind for you and I, and your children and my children okay then what we're gonna get is we're gonna get chaos we're gonna get confusion we're gonna get problems because this is just the result of not incompetence this is a result of deliberate uh, sabotage throwing a wrench in the works is what these people do they don't want it to work 
They want the poverty to grow. They want the disparity to grow. And I ask you out there, if I had to give you the keys to the money printing, to the, the economy, to the politicians, you know, the, the political policy, you tell me how you would shrink the wealth disparity. Would you shrink it, let's say, for instance, by taking from the haves to give to the have-nots? Now, a lot of people might think that sounds logical. But I'm telling you, it doesn't have to be that way because all that's going to do is give the haves just cause to dislike you, to be your enemy, to say, oh, this guy's got that Robin Hood mentality. And deep down, I know that's probably right because if I was him, I would get it. I would get take from the haves and give to the have-nots, you know, the whole tax thing, you know, make the rich pay, you know, for the have-nots so that so then the, the, the rich hate the have-nots that are on welfare and taking from the system and feeling it like they're entitled somehow. But you see, this is all part of the division that we've got to get, we've got to get past. So I'm not in favor of taking from the haves through taxation. That's going to create animosity. That's going to give them justification to hate me. And I'm not, I don't want to give any man justification to hate me. I want to be a friend to everybody. And the way I can do that, the way I can say, look, this is a mathematical solution, is point to sound currency. It always comes back to money. The love of money is a root of all evil. It all comes back to sound currency. And what sound currency is, it's a currency that has accountability. It has checks and balances baked into the recipe, okay? And what that will do, it'll create a situation that allows a rising tide of prosperity to lift all ships. And the reason is very simple, and I've explained this before and I'd like to explain it again. The reason has to do with supply and demand economics. And supply and demand economics is a mathematical calculation. This has to do with progress. This has to do with humanity, society, civilized society, civilized civilization, as a collective working together to find easier and easier ways to produce our needs, that is to supply our needs. And not only our needs, but our wants. You know, our wants like a washing machine, for example, that a lot of people take for granted, but they don't understand that they didn't exist a couple hundred years ago, that this is a very nice luxury that due to our inventiveness, our ingenuity, our desire to make tasks easier, that we invented, we invented collectively as a civilized society. So this ingenuity belongs to society as a collective. This is progress. So then we found easier and easier ways to make these washing machines. And we made develop factories and it was very quick and easy. And then we realized that, you know, we had this superfluity, this excess. We were oversupplying not only our needs but our wants. And you can see where this leads. So not only do you have an ever declining work week because the need for labor isn't there anymore. We've developed machinery and equipment, automation, mechanization. This is industrialization to take the jobs that used to, you know, for instance, on, on a farm, for example, one piece of heavy equipment takes the job of countless men it's just, a, and is that a bad thing? Should we say, oh, they took their jobs? Or should we say, wow, our load has been lightened. You know, humanity is progressing. Our wealth is growing collectively. This is where you have this rising tide of prosperity across the board. This is progress. This is sharing the wealth that we collectively have created through working together and finding easier and easier means to meet, again, not only our needs like food and shelter and clean water, but our wants like automobiles, electronics and washing machines and sailboats and, and airplanes and, you know, I could go on all day with the, you know, the things that we want, the trinkets that we, we enjoy. But um, you get the point. And so not only does your work, your work week is always in steady decline. Okay, so the biggest challenge that we have in a situation like that is finding what to do with our time. 
Okay, that's what I'm asking people to do. So if people want to hate me because I'm for closing the wealth disparity by making the poor, uh, instead of being have-nots, by making them to be haves, then that's your problem. You've chosen to be my enemy. But I know in my heart that I'm no man's enemy, and it's my prerogative, it's my choice, it's my entitlement, as is it yours. It's your right to be everybody's friend and say, hey, listen, I'm not for taking from you. You've got no justification to hate me. But if you're opposed to social economic equality, whereby the 